Ephesians 1 and verse 11 reads, In whom ye also trusted, verse 13, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The author of this passage of Scripture uses the phrase, the gospel of your salvation. Salvation is my salvation. God has offered unto me salvation through the gospel. I must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ in order to obtain this salvation. Because salvation has been placed in the person of Christ. God's plan for salvation included Christ coming into the world, born of the Virgin Mary, dying on the cross of Calvary, being resurrected from the grave, procuring for all who would trust in Him salvation. But salvation is found in a message. And this message is identified in the pages of the Bible as the gospel. Hence Paul's phrase, the gospel of your salvation. For the gospel to save us, we must hear the gospel. The gospel is to be proclaimed. The gospel is to be preached. In Mark 16, 15, Jesus said to His disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The gospel is my salvation, but it is a message for everyone. The magnificent love of Almighty God included the salvation for every human soul. Regardless of one's standing in human life, God wants that soul redeemed by the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 1, verses 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. The preaching of the gospel is the preaching of the cross. The preaching of the cross has the power to save, but it also has the power to perish. One must hear the gospel in order to be saved. If one chooses not to hear the gospel, then that one is in danger of perishing. In verse 23, the apostle said, We preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. And then in verse 2 of chapter 2 of the same 1 Corinthian epistle, he says, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We see in these passages of Scripture that the gospel is the preaching of the cross, Christ crucified. In 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4, the apostle wrote, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, I make known unto you the gospel, which I have preached unto you, which also ye have received. Wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. How that Christ died for our sins, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Paul here identifies the gospel even as he did in chapter 1 of the first Corinthian epistle. Jesus Christ died... Jesus Christ was buried. Jesus Christ arose from the dead. That is the message of the gospel. 
According to Paul in, 1 Corinthians, in, in Ephesians 1 and verse 13, one must trust that gospel in order for that gospel to have the power to save his or her soul. In Romans 1 and verse 16, the writer said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel has the power to save those who will believe. In Hebrews 2 and verse 3, the writer said, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was con confirmed unto us by them that heard Him. Salvation was spoken. But that salvation can be neglected. It is a great salvation. One must hear the gospel, but one must also believe the gospel in order for the gospel to save. In Romans 10 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God is preached. The message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ one believes in that message. One believes that Jesus died, that He was buried, and that He rose again. That faith leads him to accept the gospel. In Hebrews 2 and verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Not only must we hear, but we must give heed to what we have heard. We must believe the message that is spoken, the message that is preached. We must believe that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, and that Jesus rose again. We must believe that the gospel has the power to save our soul. In Hebrews 4, at verses 2 and 3, the writer of this letter said, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter in to rest. The gospel was preached, but the preached gospel, the power of God unto salvation, did not prosper some. Why not? They did not believe. The gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us. But the gospel preached unto them did not profit them. It provided no benefit to them because they did not believe that gospel was not mixed with faith. And then the writer says, We which have believed do enter in to rest. In order to enter into the rest of God, the salvation of God, we must believe the gospel. We must hear the gospel with our ear. We must believe the gospel with our heart. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, Philip told the Ethiopian, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest be baptized. The eunuch had to believe what Philip had spoken unto him concerning Jesus. This man was reading from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter 53. This is a prophecy of the suffering Savior. This prophecy tells of Christ coming into the world and Christ becoming a human sacrifice for the sins of the world. He would be despised and rejected of men. But He would die and take upon Himself the iniquities of all of the world. He began at that same scripture, Isaiah chapter 53, where this man was reading and preached unto him Jesus. If thou believest, the Ethiopian had to believe the message which was preached 
concerning Jesus Christ in order for it to profit him. In Acts chapter 16 at verses 30 and 31, the jailer asked the Peter and Silas, or Paul and Silas rather, what must I do to be saved? The answer was, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in all thy house. This man was told that in order to be saved, he must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the message of the gospel. If the gospel is preached as God intended it to be proclaimed, then it must be the message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That message has the power to save the heart that will believe it. But as we believe the gospel, we must become united with Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 13 and verse 14, the scripture says, But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not fulfill the lust according to the flesh. We are to put on Christ so that we might avoid the lust of the flesh. We put on Christ and have that new life, as Paul explained in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The spiritual heart of man is renewed by Jesus Christ. The life changes. Sins are removed because we are united with Jesus Christ. Life, eternal life, is in Jesus Christ, 1 John 5 and verse 11. We become new when we become united with Christ. The scripture explains the manner in which we become united with Christ. As we hear the gospel and believe the gospel, then we need to put on Christ. In Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27, For as many of you, are, we are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Paul here refers to two actions that one performs for his salvation. He is justified or becomes a child of God by faith. He believes the gospel. And then he becomes united with Christ by being baptized into Christ. Children of God by faith, but Christ is put on when we are baptized into Christ. Christ is not put on in our faith but Christ is put on when we are baptized into Christ. Because in being, by being baptized into Christ, we are united with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection. In Romans chapter 6, at verses 3 through 5, the apostle said, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Remember, <coughs> the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. In Romans 6, 3 through 5, the Apostle Paul shows that by being baptized into Christ, we are baptized into the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. In verse 3, he says, baptized into Jesus Christ. In verse 4, he says, buried with him by baptism into death. In verse 5, he says, been planted together in the likeness of his death and in the likeness of his resurrection.
The gospel of our salvation leads us to hear the gospel, believe the gospel, and be united with Christ. For we must wash away sin in order to be saved. The gospel of our salvation includes the removal of our sin. Sin is the reason that we need to be saved anyway. We have erred from God. We have violated His law. We have transgressed His commandments. And we need those sins removed from our human soul so that we might be saved. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 6, the apostle says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Paul is speaking of being baptized into the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He speaks of our old man being crucified with Him, with Christ. That crucifixion, it takes place so that the body of sin might be destroyed, so that henceforth we should not serve sin any longer. Jesus was crucified upon the cross. Our crucifixion takes place in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ by being united with Him in baptism. Baptism unites us with Christ and washes away or removes our sin. Baptism is the death of the old man. A death takes place in baptism. This is why being baptized into Christ is so vital. The death of Christ was necessary for the salvation of the soul. And so our death is necessary for the salvation of our soul. That death takes place when we are baptized. For there the old man is crucified. The body of sin is destroyed, so that henceforth we should no longer serve sin. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul is recounting his obedience to God before a group of Jewish people. In speaking of that encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, which is recorded in Acts chapter 9, Paul says that the preacher Ananias was sent unto him. The gospel is a spoken message. It is a preached message. The gospel of your salvation. And so Ananias, as God's appointed proclaimer of truth, was sent to Saul of Tarsus. Paul tells us what Ananias said in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. The preacher preached unto him Jesus Christ. And he said, And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Ananias tells us that two things happen when we are baptized. We wash away sins, we call on the name of the Lord. The Scripture teaches in Romans chapter 10, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. We call upon the name of the Lord when we are baptized into Jesus Christ, for there we are united with Him. Our faith in Jesus is made manifest when we are baptized into Christ. In the second chapter of the book of Acts at verse 38, Peter tells this multitude who have asked the question, What shall we do? They had been pricked in their heart. Peter had preached unto them that Jesus had been crucified by their wicked hands. That caused them to have conviction. They believed the message, the gospel that Peter proclaimed that day. What shall we do? Repent, verse 38, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If we look at that passage and we return to Ephesians 1 and verse 13, 
in whom we also trusted after that we heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Peter says, you will are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, whereby we are sealed unto salvation. There is a great correlation between Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and Ephesians 1 and verse 38. We're baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, whereby we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit sealed unto our salvation. In Colossians chapter 2 at verses 11 and 12, the apostle wrote to the church at Colossae and said, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. We are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. That circumcision, says the apostle, is the putting off of the sins of the flesh. Christ performs this circumcision. When? Buried with him in baptism. Wherein also ye are risen with him. This correlates with what Paul said in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. We're buried with Christ in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, wherein also we are raised with Him. But the apostle says in verse 12, this is through the faith of the operation of God. God performs His spiritual operation of circumcision, the putting off of the sins of the body of the flesh in the water of baptism. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul has gone over the sins of which the Corinthian church was guilty in verses 9 and 10. He says that those who commit such sins shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But in verse 11, he says, "...ye are washed, ye are justified, ye are sanctified in the name of the Spirit of our God." When and how were they justified, sanctified by God? Acts 18 and verse 8 tells us of Paul's visit to Corinth when he was on his missionary tour of preaching the gospel. Many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. They became justified and sanctified and cleansed from these particular sins of which they were guilty when they heard the gospel, believed the gospel, and were baptized. When we hear, believe, become united with Christ and have our sins washed away, the Bible teaches that we are added to the church. The church is God's community of the saved. The church is God's body of those who are believers, followers of Jesus Christ who have become united with Him and saved by His gospel. In Acts 2 and verse 47, the scripture says, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Notice in this passage that one does not join the church of his choice because man has no choice. The church is God's body created in Christ Jesus by His death, burial, and resurrection. God adds us to the church. He places us into this body whereby we are saved because we have been obedient to the gospel which has been preached and which we have believed. In Hebrews 12 and verse 23, the scripture says to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. The church of the firstborn is the church of Jesus Christ. For according to Colossians 1 and verse 18, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Revelation chapter 1 also tells us that Jesus is the firstborn 
from the dead. The church of the firstborn, the church that belongs to Jesus by His death upon the cross of Calvary. And to those who are in this church, their names are written in heaven. When Paul writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, he says to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, call to be saints. The church is the sanctified in Christ Jesus. How were they sanctified? By becoming united with Christ through baptism after having heard and believed the gospel of their salvation. They are known as saints. The name of the redeemed of the Lord's church is saints because they have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. The term sanctified simply means that we have been made fit for the service of God. We have been made fit because our sins have been removed through the death of Christ upon the cross and our obedience of baptism. We have become united with God, the friends of God, and therefore we are fit, prepared for the service of God, hence our sanctification. The gospel of your salvation. The gospel is for me. The gospel is for you. The gospel is for all individuals. And the Bible speaks in Jude verse 3 of a common salvation. A salvation that is open to all and to everyone. But all come to saving faith in Christ by hearing that gospel, believing that gospel, becoming united with Christ, having their sins washed away, being added to the church, the body of the saved, the redeemed, the sanctified in Christ Jesus. Hear the gospel of your salvation. Believe the gospel of your salvation. Become united with Jesus Christ. Wash away your sins. Become added to the church. And you are sealed by God's Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. The gospel of your salvation. We offer the invitation of Jesus as we close this service and as we stand and sing this hymn of invitation.